Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this webinar, Designing Streets for All Ages and Abilities Bicycling, um, with the NACTO Association of City Transportation of Officials and some of our revered partners today. We're really excited to bring this session. Um, we have uh, two great speakers, and then uh, myself, uh, my name is Aaron Villery. I'm a senior program associate with the Designing Cities Initiative at NACTO. Um, and before we get underway, I just want to uh, do a qu couple quick housekeeping uh, things. First of all, uh, this, this webinar will be recorded, um, and both the video and the slideshows that you're going to see will be posted uh, after, um, after the conclusion of the webinar later this week. Um, and second of all, I, I want to encourage you, uh, you'll see on the, on the panel that you have the, the control panel for GoToWebinar. Uh, there is a box to enter questions. Um, and rather, uh, about 40 to 45 minutes of this session will be focused on presentations. And then we'll, we'll spend the last 15 to 20 minutes answering questions. Um, but rather than opening it up uh, to have people ask questions directly, um, just feel free to enter uh, questions as you think of them throughout the webinar. So throughout any of the speakers um, into that questions panel, and we'll uh, we'll get to as, as many as we're able to um, during the actual session. And then we'll actually uh, uh, our speakers have agreed after the conclusion of the webinar um, to uh, answer some some follow up questions in, in writing. So. Uh, we really appreciate their time on that, and, and please don't be shy about asking questions, and we'll get to as many as we can um, uh, during the end of the webinar. Um, so with that, um, oh, and also this, uh, this is uh, eligible for AICP credits, um, so uh, be, it's been registered through the uh, APA website, so if, if you're seeking AICP credits, it, it's equal to one credit hour, and you can register uh, through the website. But, uh, if you have any questions about how to do that, uh, don't feel, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to events at NACTO.org um, for assistance. Uh, and with that, uh, we're just going to jump right in. So, uh, as I said, uh, my name is Aaron Villery. I'm, uh, I work with the Designing Cities Initiative at NACTO, um, and I'm really thrilled to be joined uh, by by two leaders in, in the field who are really thinking about uh, making bicycling as a form of transportation more inclusive. Um, and, and more uh, attractive and, and wide ranging in cities and, and really leveraging that as a safety strategy, um, as a mobility strategy and, and thinking about all the ways uh, that cities can really unlock bicycling. Um, so first we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Rachel Aldred, um, who is a reader in transport at the University of Westminster. Um, and you may remember her from uh, a webinar uh, that she delivered on the NACTO network last year on her study in the Near Miss Project. Um, Followed by, I'll be presenting NACTO's uh, guidance uh, on designing streets for uh, all ages and abilities bicycling. Um, and then uh, we'll finish uh, hearing from Becky Katz, who's the chief bicycle officer out of the city of Atlanta. So we're really thrilled to have uh, them joining me today and, and uh, be raising this, this topic. So uh, Rachel Aldred, uh, as I mentioned, is, is a reader in transport at uh, Westminster University, um, and she joined us last year. Her research includes the Near Miss Project, uh, the Cycling Cultures Project, the Modeling on the Move Project, and most recently a project on adults' views on cycling with or by children. Uh, Rachel is passionate about improving everyday cycling for all ages and abilities, and we're really thrilled to have her talk about uh, some of her research on uh, making cycling more inclusive. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the reins over to Rachel. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Erin, and I'm really pleased to be presenting today. So I'm going to talk for about uh, 12 minutes or so about disabled people and cycling getting towards inclusivity. And this is a topic that has become increasingly discussed in the UK at the moment. There's traditionally been no assumption that disabled people and cyclists are two kind of mutually exclusive categories. So we're battling against an assumption that disabled people don't cycle and that all cyclists are able-bodied. And I think we're still, we're still struggling against that. One of the things that has really helped us is that disabled people have started organising, started coming forward and saying, we cycle and we need things to be better. And that's really helped change the debate. In particular in London, there's an organisation called Wheels for Wellbeing that has really become um, a voice for disabled cyclists in London. 
and increasingly contributing to discussion about street design. So one of the first things that um, we had to answer really talking about this topic was, well, how many disabled people cycle? How much cycling is there by disabled people? And this was difficult because there wasn't the data necessarily to, to, to look at that. So we have a census where we look at travel to work and the census also asks about disability. But um, in the standard census tables, they didn't produce information about travel to work by disability. So we had to specially request that data. We also did some reanalysis of data from other surveys as well. So this is what um, some of the statistics came out as showing that disabled people do cycle in the UK and England, um, but there is a participation gap. So in terms of the census travel to work data, just over 5% of cycle commuters in England and Wales have some kind of a disability. Um, the, the census question is, is your, are your day-to-day -day activities limited in some way? So around 5%, compared to just under 7% of all commuters who report being disabled under this definition. There's other data from something called the Active People Survey that measures all types of cycling and walking. And in this survey, we find that 3% of disabled people compared to 7% of non-disabled people cycled for transport during the past month in England. So cycling levels are generally pretty low, um, but there is a participation gap. Disabled people do cycle, but there's a gap. However, one thing that's quite interesting when you look at the data is the fact that these rates of cycling among disabled people really vary. And one of the things that's, that's most important really is how people travel in a particular local area. So this, for instance, is London, and this shows us the percentage of disabled commuters and the percentage of all commuters using different modes of travel. And you can see there's a fairly similar picture, really. Public transport is dominant, followed by the car, followed by walking, and cycling is still in London fairly marginal for people generally cycling to work and for disabled people cycling to work. There is that participation gap, but uh, we're looking at around sort of 3% versus 5% cycling to work. By contrast, when we look at Cambridge, and Cambridge is the place within the UK that has the highest cycling rates, you can see a very different picture. So again, the orange bar is um, commute mode share for everyone, and the blue bar is commute mode share for people who report being disabled. So here in Cambridge, the um, mode with the highest chair is the car, but it's followed pretty closely by the bicycle because, as I mentioned, cycling in Cambridge is very widespread. So 32, 33% of all commuters in Cambridge get to work by bike. Now, for disabled people, it's lower, but it's still 26%. So one in four disabled commuters in Cambridge are cycling to work. So much, much higher than the figure for London. And you can see um, further behind, we have walking, we have use of public transport. And use of those modes is pretty similar um, for non-disabled and disabled commuters. So a very different picture to London. So I guess the point is that we, doing this data analysis, sort of showed us a couple of things. That firstly, that participation in cycling by disabled people is strongly associated with participation in cycling more broadly. So there are places within England and Wales, there are places where 0.2% of disabled people cycle to work, i.e. virtually no one. And these are also places where nobody cycles to work from other groups too. So, you know, overall cycling to work might be 0.3%. By disabled people, it's 0.2%. So these are places that are very, very cycling hostile. And by contrast, places like Cambridge that have a lot more cycling generally, cycling is normal by disabled commuters, by disabled commute people more broadly. But I think we also need to note that there's an additional gap. So even in Cambridge, you've still got a gap. You've still got 26% of disabled commuters cycling to work versus 33% for all commuters. So I think we do also need to think about additional barriers that disabled cyclists um, are experiencing. And I'll say something about that in a minute. So firstly, I think it's really important to improve conditions for cycling generally. Um, in order that disabled people and other currently underrepresented groups are able to participate in cycling. Um, and I think if you look at the picture on the right of the screen, cycle infrastructure design, that is our national infrastructure design guidance still in the UK. And the image of that, it's not a welcoming, it's not an inclusive environment. It's not something that most people want to experience, but particularly um, for people in underrepresented groups among cycling, it can be particularly off-putting for women, for older people, for disabled people. By contrast, in the middle, we have um, a guide that was put together by the Cambridge Cycling Campaign called Making Space for Cycling. And throughout, 
it's trying to give a more inclusive image, trying to show how if we build um, you know, safe, comfortable cycling environments. We can make these friendly for people from all, um, all groups of society, people who are riding all kinds of cycles. And indeed, in Cambridge, you see people riding cargo bikes, trikes, e-bikes, a whole range of different kinds of cycles. I think it's important that lack of protection from motor traffic um, is something that we know has a disproportionate um, effect on different groups. Some groups are more risk averse than others. If we build routes that make cyclists share with busy motor traffic, we're going to get the young, the fit and the brave, and we're not going to get that many of them. Detours are also important. So interestingly, as routes get longer, this disproportionately puts off, say, women and older people. So if routes make people take the long way round, that too may put off people who are not the young, the fit and the brave. Obstacles are something that disabled cyclists have raised as being a big problem. And this is another example of something that's a problem for everyone. It's a problem for cyclists generally, but it can be an absolute barrier if you're disabled. So if you look at some of these examples, these are real examples <laughs> where um, on cycle routes, barriers are put up. Um, you know, there's often temporary obstacles as well. Cyclists dismount, follow pedestrian route. So for someone like me, that's really annoying. But for somebody who can't dismount, who can't carry their bike, for somebody who's carrying kids in a cargo bike, that's an absolute barrier. You can't use that route. And I don't think it complies with our disability legislation, but we still see these kinds of things. But as I mentioned, as well as building really good quality cycling environments, I think we need to also think about the additional barriers that disabled people face in terms of cycling. So as well as um, planning for cycling for all, we sort of need to think about specifics as well, things that, may things that may particularly affect some groups and maybe not others so much. So, for instance, one of the issues that's raised by uh, Wheels for Wellbeing and other um, groups, other disabled cyclist groups, is around the cost of different types of bike that disabled people may need. So if, if you want a basic entry level bicycle, you may be paying, say, 200 pounds, I don't know, 250, 300 dollars or something. But if you need a side by side tricycle, um, an electric assist tricycle and so on, you may be paying 10 times that. So most people can't afford those kind of cycles. They're harder to park um, potentially as well. They might get stolen more easily. So those kind of barriers. Also, as I mentioned at the start, there's this assumption that um, cyclists, no, no cyclist is disabled and that no disabled people cycle. And this is a kind of very um, traditional assumption about the kind of people who cycle. And that cyclist dismount sign that we see a lot in the UK sort of expresses the view that everyone who can cycle can also walk, which is not true, but it's an assumption that's made. Another thing that I think we need to think about is destination planning. So, you know, we might be building good cycle tracks. Hopefully we are. But are we building them only to commute destinations? Because that, for instance, doesn't do, doesn't provide routes necessarily that retired people might want to use. And older people have a relatively high chance of having a disability. So, you know, who are we planning for? What are our what are our assumptions when we're planning? And I think this is why it's so important to hear the voices of underrepresented groups um, such as disabled cyclists, disabled people who want to cycle, because there's a tendency for planning to just reproduce the assumptions of the past unless it's actively um, challenged. And this is just an example, um, finally, from some analysis that um, I did with Wheels for Wellbeing, looking at how London borough transport strategies represented disabled people. And this was quite interesting. We did a textual analysis of um, 30 odd London borough transport strategies. And in general, most of them didn't talk about disabled people as potentially cycling. Um, it was quite common to talk about disabled people's public transport users. Nearly all of them did. Um, and most talked about disabled people as pedestrians, but it was pretty rare to have reference to disabled people as potentially cycling. So that kind of reinforces this assumption that you don't need to plan for disabled people to cycle. This is something that they don't do. And kind of challenging those preconceptions are really important. We also looked at imagery and found that, you know, um, generally the kind of adapted cycles that some disabled people use were not represented, they were not seen. And that matters too, because those kind of cycles may need more space when you're planning, when you're building cycle tracks. Um, so there are, just, just, to, um, just to finish, there are some kind of hopeful signs, I think. So one, the example on the left is something that's being discussed in London. So in the UK, um, disabled drivers are allowed to drive and park places that non-disabled drivers aren't. So they can park on double yellow lines, for instance. So um, this 
is an example of something that could be used for disabled cyclists to allow them potentially to use pedestrian zones and so on. So this is still under discussion, but it would hopefully signal that people do use cycles as a mobility aid. You can't necessarily get off and walk. You can't necessarily push your bike. On the right, we have quite a nice document that was uh, written for Highways England, which runs our strategic road network. And this document develops the idea of a cycle design vehicle which may look like the image there, you know, it may be wider, it may be longer than a traditional bicycle. So actually getting that into engineering guidance so that engineers think, okay, actually somebody may be riding that kind of thing, not just a two wheeler, um, we need to think about, we need to plan for that, here are the dimensions. So I think changing planning is really important, changing the assumptions that are embedded there. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just um, finish there, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I want to thank uh, Rachel for, for presenting uh, the work that, that she's been doing uh, uh, on identifying the barriers um, to making cycling more inclusive. And I think with that, uh, I'm just going to segue right in. So um, the thing we're really excited to talk about at NACTO um, is that uh, these barriers are starting to be uh, revealed more and more and talked about, thankfully, in planning discussions. Um, but we're really at a, at a point, especially in North America, where, where we're moving into the next generation of, of cycling infrastructure. And so NACTO um, worked with some of our cities, and I want to do a quick hat tip um, to some of the, the primary driving forces uh, behind this guidance that we're really excited to have premiered in December and to be talking about today. Um, so I just want to quickly call out Nathan Wilkes, the city of Austin. Uh, Roger Geller, the city of Portland, Jason Padman, the city of Oakland, and Kara Seidemann um, in the city of Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, not UK, uh, for their work in, uh, in really uh, leading the way and, and driving forward this, this effort. Um, so yeah, with that, um, uh, Rachel was able to talk about uh, how, to, how uh, in the UK they're, they're identifying barriers, and I think we have a lot of similar barriers and, and sort of needs in, in our engineering discussions um, that are really worth surfacing, um, but it really starts with this idea of uh, who are we designing for, um, and when we think about bicycle infrastructure, uh, how are we matching our values to the, the things we actually design? Um, and so just to, to take a step backwards, 2011, uh, as many of you may be familiar with the Urban Bikeway Design Guide, uh, NACTO's uh, sort of first design guide publication, um, which uh, was an enabling document that brought forward a lot of uh, bicycle treatments from bike lanes to separated bike lanes um, and, and put them in national guidance um, in, in a way that was very useful for cities. And what we saw uh, after the urban bikeway design guide um, was that uh, after it was published, there was, uh, it coincided with a really explosive growth uh, in protected bike lane mileage and just general bike infrastructure uh, in, in North America and in cities in North America. So. Um, Having that enabling document, uh, I, I think, sort of set free a lot of cities to uh, develop better bike infrastructure. But now we're at this sort of critical moment that we have to take the next step and, and really think about this question of who we're designing for. Um, so cities are making really large strides in installing bike infrastructure. But oftentimes, this bike infrastructure is, is placed on streets that is just not going to attract ridership. Um, hate doesn't protect uh, people, uh, and especially um, as speed and volume increase, the, the population that's going to be willing to ride is very limited. And this is just another example of, you're gonna see uh, a certain number of riders, and, and these uh, pieces of infrastructure are important for sort of laying the groundwork, but we need to take that next step. And, and just to kind of take a step back, the way that we've um, sort of developed infrastructure uh, in the US, and one of the things that's kind of held back from more explosive growth in mode share is that we've not always responded to demand for, uh, for places to bike. Um, we've often been a little incremental or timid to take space from cars, um, to proceed taking space from cars and giving it to cyclists rather than providing um, substantively safe infrastructure, and not uh, being responsive to how people actually want to move around our cities. 
we know that uh, this is looking at aggregate data from uh, from seven uh, six cities in, in the U.S. That as they develop or as they grew their infrastructure between 2006 and 2013, 100 um, percent, the ray of cycling in those cities grew even faster, and the relative risk uh, fell by half. So we know that providing safe bikeways brings more people out and actually reduces the risk to those cyclists. So uh, better, more comprehensive bike networks are reducing risk and stress and encouraging more people to ride, and we know this. Um, but what this guidance really sought to do was to, to raise the question of who we're forgetting. Um, there's sort of really well-trod well research around, you know, uh, if we design there, that about 7% of the population is willing to ride in sort of nominal bike infrastructure, um, that maybe a third is, is not currently interested in riding. And then there's this huge universe of up to 60% um, of people who are interested in riding, but uh, are not finding their needs met by uh, by conventional bike lanes um, and painted infrastructure. But what we wanted to do is, is, as Rachel was alluding to, is pull apart who are these riders that we're missing. Are we uh, thinking about children? Are we thinking about women, uh, people with disabilities, seniors who are uh, a huge growing population, more casual riders, people uh, moving cargo, uh, people biking for deliveries, um, bike share riders, but very different riding characteristics. And we need to be uh, integrating and, and thinking of these different users as our design users, and that when we think about how we're putting down infrastructure, that we need to be meeting this missing market. And so that's where uh, the guidance uh, comes in. So designing for all ages and abilities is a, uh, it's a short document um, that provides contextual guidance for selecting high comfort uh, bicycle facilities on a variety of street types. Um, and this sets the standard, or sets the benchmark, rather, that all ages and abilities is where cities should be starting first uh, when thinking about uh, selecting bike facilities on a street. Um, and it means uh, providing pl uh, spaces that are substantively safe um, and not just nominally safe. It, it means re uh, providing facilities that reduce crashes, not designing the minimums and providing contextually appropriate infrastructure that works for riders who are riding at different speeds, have different size characteristics, and are moving differently uh, through their streets and have different risk thresholds. Uh, it means creating spaces that are, that are attractive and inviting. Uh, less than 10% of the adult population in the U.S. Uh, uh, has reported in surveys to uncomfortable biking and mixed traffic, but as many as 81% would ride in protected lanes. Uh, building better Infrastructure means capturing and converting uh, more trips and especially short trips in cities. Um, and finally, all Asian abilities means uh, putting uh, the infrastructure that is already being demanded underneath people and doing that in a way that's sensitive to some of the existing barriers uh, in our transportation networks. Um, poor infrastructure often forces riders to choose between feeling safe and following the rules of the road and it creates this tension that we uh, that we know about and have data that low-income communities, communities of color, are disproportionately impacted by unsafe street design and risk. And so putting down better bikeways is going to make ordinary riding safe and legal. And this is something that has to be a top of line consideration. And so what this guidance is really trying to, to peel apart and is sensitive to um, are the two drivers uh, of stress that um, dissuade people from riding our speed, so specifically as speed increases on a roadway, the number of passing events and the number of uh, interactions with motor vehicles increases. As volume increases on a roadway, we find the same thing. And as you put those together, as speed and volume increase, you're, you're introducing more risk, more interactions, more uh, moments that discourage people and, and aggregate throughout the, uh, the duration of a ride. And it's also important to acknowledge that streets change throughout the day. So a street that is high volume at peak period is gonna have high speeds at non-peak periods. And so we need to be thinking about a day in the life of the street when we're selecting bike infrastructure and addressing those different sources of stress at different times of the day. And so this is the contextual guidance table. If we could distill this into one page, this is uh, this is the table, and, and it's meant to be bi-directional. So the way that it works is that it starts with a target motor vehicle speed, 
uh, which is say the, the speed that you're trying to get to on the on the roadway. Um, the motor vehicle volume that you want to accommodate on that roadway, um, the number of motor vehicle lanes, uh, any additional key operational considerations, and these are observed operational factors on the street. And finally, uh, what the appropriate all-ages bike facility is for a street with those conditions. Now, this is meant to be an all-ages and abilities uh, benchmark, uh, which is, uh, I want to clarify quickly that Designing quote unquote less than uh, what's specified uh, in this table doesn't mean that it's a bad bike facility and it's not a reason not to install it. It just means that using our best city guidance, this is what we understand as uh, will meet uh, in all ages and abilities condition within a given street context. And just to, to quickly uh, take you through kind of how it works and, and how you can think about applying it. So if you have a street, uh, for instance, uh, and you're trying to target a motor vehicle speed that is uh, less than or equal to 25 uh, miles per hour. And you know that the street has about 1,500 vehicles per day. Um, it has a single lane in, in one direction or it doesn't have a center line if it's two-way. Um, and that you don't have uh, really high peak hours. But this is a really good candidate for, for a shared roadway condition, for a bicycle boulevard or a greenway or whatever your preferred uh, name for that condition. But low speed and low volume roadways can be shared and most people will be comfortable riding in that. But what, what that means to get there is you have to use both peak and off peak speed and volume. You have to be sensitive to those uh, design hour considerations. Um, people are not gonna feel comfortable biking uh, around traffic as it exceeds uh, 20 or 25 miles an hour. Um, and you really have to cut down high end speed. Uh, when you think about 85th percentile speed, that means um, 15 out of every 100 cars might be doing over that. So if you have an 85th percentile speed uh, of 25 miles an hour, you might still have really high speeds that are gonna discourage people from riding. It means uh, actively managing volume on the street. Um, and thinking about the sources of stress like deliveries and, and double parking and, uh, and large vehicle presence. Um, within that same speed band, uh, let's say you have a similar volume um, maybe it's, it's a little higher. Uh, you might have a single lane one way, but there's uh, very little curbside uh, pressure or congestion. You might uh, be able to, to use a conventional bike lane, but what's important to remember is that conventional bike lanes and buffered bike lanes organize street space. They don't provide physical protection. So it means um, uh, Setting uh, 95th percentile speed below 25 miles an hour, reducing those high-end speeding events, reducing motor vehicle volume, uh, managing curbside conflicts that are gonna uh, encroach on the bike lane um, and create moments of stress, addressing intersection conflicts, and decreasing the passing uh, discomfort from uh, motor vehicle traffic. And finally, as volume increases, even at uh, that 25 mile an hour speed, um, if you have very high volumes, uh, you're gonna to wanna to, uh, separate that bike uh, infrastructure. And providing that vertical separation can be really transformative. So it's, it's anywhere where, where speed is over 25 miles an hour, it's gonna degrade comfort for most people. Um, you wanna carry protection all the way up to the intersection, um, reduce curbside conflicts, um, manage where, where freight and, and deliveries are happening. Um, upgrade separation as stress increases, so the speed increases. Uh, means of separation have to get more robust and minimize the number of travel lanes. And so I quickly want to talk through just some, some strategies uh, for actually transforming streets. It's not always about the cross section. There are sort of overlapping factors for, for changing the street. And this guidance really talks about design, operation, and network management. Um, and these are, are meant to be applied together. So with design, you know, you might it might be updating existing facilities or, or reducing the number of motor vehicle lanes and making incremental improvements. This is J Street in Brooklyn. Um, and in the before condition, the conventional bike lane, just flipping it and moving it to the, to the curbside and providing that little bit of protection makes a huge amount of difference for the street. Thinking about how you operate the street, this should be done in tandem with design changes, but uh, lowering the, the progression speed of signals, uh, prohibiting turns that create conflicts, um, 
separating uh, vehicles and bikes into different phases. Um, and really thinking about how you're changing the, the role of that street and, and what the operational characteristics are. And finally, thinking about network changes, thinking about uh, upgrading the network role within, uh, within the, the bicycle network, um, what kinds of vehicles and at what times of day are allowed. These are all really potent changes and, and sort of the, the most obvious one is the bicycle boulevard, but it might be managing things throughout the day, uh, like large vehicle presence, like uh, signalized and, and, and allowed movements. Um, and finally, uh, this is really about reducing stress and maximizing comfort for people riding. So your design just has to be sensitive to the, the things that you're witnessing on the street. So if you have a street with multiple motor vehicle lanes, be sensitive that it, that introduces a lot of dynamism for people cycling and, and a lot of hard to predict conditions. So it might be um, reducing down to a single motor vehicle lane. Um, just to manage and manage in those turning movements. Um, if you have congestion, just be aware of the opportunities for, for incursion on the bike lane and provide protection, provide uh, management uh, in places where, where the roadway is getting congested. Um, limit and, and really uh, slow down the, the nature of conflicts at intersections and interactions between vehicles um, and bicycles. Uh, and finally, uh, don't pit bikes against transit. Uh, think about those spots in the roadway where um, where interactions that discourage people from biking are going to happen. Um, and don't relegate by bikes and buses to the curb and force them to compete with one another. Um, these are both uh, high capacity modes uh, that are very sensitive or um, um, very well optimized to uh, urban settings. Um, so give them their space in the cross section. And manage curbside interactions. Um, this is a great example, just thinking about uh, where those interactions are gonna happen in the roadway. Um, and really seize the opportunity to make transformative investments. We're gonna hear from a city that's doing this, but um, this is an opportunity to make roadways that really fit the city that you want to be. Um, this is a commitment, uh, not just at the project scale or, or the quarter scale, but at the citywide scale to biking as mobility. Um, and so all of this is available online if you go to nafto.org slash UBDG. It's available as a chapter, and you can also download the PDF. And I really want to thank you all uh, for joining today. And with that, I want to hand it over uh, to Becky Katz, who is the City of Atlanta's first Chief, Chief Bicycle Officer. And in this role, she works across city and state departments and with the public to make Atlanta safer, easier, and better by bike. Her main initiatives include overseeing the relay bike share system, increasing the city's bikeway mileage through the Renew Atlanta Infrastructure Bond and Peace Law, and other capital programs and leading uh, Cycle Atlanta uh, planning study. So with that, Becky, I will hand it to you. All right. One second, let me flip this screen. We all good? Great. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited about this topic, about where we currently are as a city, where we've been, and where we're going. And so uh, just to baseline things about Atlanta, um, you know, I wanted to just give you guys a brief summary of, of where we are on bike infrastructure generally. So um, we, over the past couple of years, have had the largest increase of on-street and, and multi-use path facilities in our city's history. We're also implementing projects at a faster rate. Um, we have 1,600 miles of roadway um, and 116 miles of, of bike infrastructure of certain types. Um, and we are really starting to gear ourselves to focus much more on these higher quality facilities that um, we've already seen in our city making a much larger impact on ridership. Um, 
you know, you can even see on the bike counters, we have eco counters on our streets, that um, 10th Street is protected and is by and far and large our uh, most ridden street um, versus 5th and Peachtree, which are great connectors, but they're just painted bike lanes. So where have we been? Um, you know, I'm really approaching this topic from where uh, cities often get their guidance from. Uh, 1995 was the first time the city ever passed um, a, um, a adopted a bike plan. Um, and you can see here that we only said that there were three types of classes of bike facilities, multi-use paths, Bike lanes, bike shoulders, or white curb lanes were all in the same class and shared travel lane. Um, what's interesting about this one, um, about the selection guidance here, was that um, you know it, it kind of hints in that section about connectivity. Um, bike lanes are appropriate when they connect to other existing bike lanes, so that's probably the first mention of network for us. But as you can see that Ontario's and major collectors here were recommending bike lanes. Um, and then on anything else, we're recommending um, wide curb lanes and shared lane markings. Then in 2008, we updated the bike plan. We had very little bike infrastructure installed between that time. So this is just a rejuvenation of an effort to get more bike infrastructure. Um, this is interesting because it just provided more design options about uh, bike lanes. <laughs> so, you know, it was like, all right, if it has curb and gutter, it's five feet. If it has header curb, it's five feet. <laughs> so, um, you know, and if anything, this was a little bit of a step back because it does make this mention of, you know, if there's on-street parking, you know, you have to do an additional study and you have to determine if the bike lane is an acceptable design option, um, which, you know, obviously that is subjective. So from there, really, when, you know, the country and um, was starting to, and other cities were really starting to lead the way on protected bike infrastructure, on getting people to ride, and on NACTO releasing the Urban Bikeway Guide, we at the city did some what I call a gap filler of process because we had no real guidance. Um, all we had in our toolbox, you know, was you can install five foot bike lanes or you can install five foot bike lanes. Um, and so here is uh, two studies that we've done, one in 2013 and one that um, is uh, about to be adopted by council. Um, we call them Cycle Atlanta 1.0 and 2.0. Um, this was where we took uh, specific areas of town and fully designed cross-section by cross-section, block by block, what we wanted to see. We even in, took tricky intersections and actually did, you know, kind of 2% design, 5% design concepts, as you see on the right at the McDaniels and Ralph David Abernathy intersection. Right, and this has actually been an amazing gap filler for us uh, without having any criteria of selection. We just said, okay, we have best practices countrywide. Let's look at our roadway network. Let's plan bike facilities in a system and in a network. Cycle Atlanta 1.0 looked inside the Beltline and 2.0 looked at six different uh, transit stations and two miles from those transit stations. So this is also good from an inclusiveness perspective because you can select an area of town. Um, and some of the outcomes of this, this is an intersection that was in Cycle Atlanta 1.0. Um, the guidance from that plan led to this. Um, this is our Tech Parkway um, project that uh, just to flip back and forth. Um, it was a really high speed intersection. This divided median street was both ways. We closed one whole side down, um, and that was directly from Cycle Atlanta 1.0. So um, even though it limits you on which roads, because you're specifically designing for specific roads, it has been a very effective selection criteria for us by laying out exactly what uh, we determined was appropriate. 
But as you know, that those were year-long studies. They both cost, you know, upwards of $100,000. So it's not, you know, effective from a citywide perspective. So, you know, um, starting in kind of 2013, 2015, we were really, at the city, inspired by LA's um, Manual for Design of Living Streets. And so we started to develop something similar, and it was really a consolidation of all the previous roadway manuals, and it had a chapter on bikeways. Um, and we had tons and tons of manuals, and we've been working on that since, uh, you know, this time. But we um, determined that it needed kind of more importance and more concentration. So we actually ended up rolling it into our current comprehensive transportation planning, which we are um, currently uh, completing. This was an update to our 2008 comprehensive transportation plan. And in it, so we're going to adopt this roadway guidance manual um, that has a chapter about bikes. And when we were discussing this through the transportation plan, NAFTO had just released this design guidance for choosing a facility type. And I have to say that some a tool that we have used constantly in Atlanta is to look at what other cities are doing. And instead of redoing all the work, um, making it, you know, quote unquote, locally sensitive, how can we take the best parts of it and adopt it um, without, you know, uh, reinventing it? So this is a good example of where we are taking the NACTO guidance, um, the contextual guidance that has just been released. And we're actually just going to adopt that within our roadway manual um, and say that this is really where how we want to start to select projects. Um, the follow up of that is like, OK, how do you operationalize it, which um, we are starting to look at um, report forms and the you know, a complete street report form where you fill it out before you go into the design process. And we continue to refine that and work with our capital project partners across the city to discuss how to operationalize. But I'm really excited because as you can see from the 2008 um, guidance, this is a huge leap forward for us and will be the first time that from a citywide perspective, we're adopting guidance on protected bike facilities, on um, like facilities that are linked to both speed and volume and not just if it's a dedicated arterial or collector. Um, so, and, you know, just in terms of, again, what we're also thinking out beyond this adoption of our comprehensive transportation plan is really also how to link affordability to new infrastructure, um, because we want to ensure that as we include all ages and abilities, that we also think about the impacts of our infrastructure. And as we get higher quality pedestrian and bike infrastructure, how we make sure that our existing community members benefit and our new community members also benefit. So thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Becky. Um, and I will take the reins back. So we've gotten a lot of great questions uh, from the audience. Please feel uh, free to, to keep submitting those and we'll try to uh, get to as many as we can. Um, we have, uh, I think about 15 minutes uh, to discuss, so this is great, we're right on, on track. Um, so the first question uh, is uh, for Rachel, um, which is uh, kind of a clarifying question, which is how did you define disabilities in your research? Um, did that, uh, include anyone who identified with a disability or did that include people with uh, um, just physical or were there uh, cognitive impairments? Uh, if you can just talk a little bit about how, um, how that definition is formed. Yeah, that's a very good question. And often we were limited in terms of the data that was available. So in the census data, the question asked is, um, are your day-to-day -day activities limited a lot or a little? So it's that kind of a question. In the National Travel Survey, by contrast, it's a really broad um, question that then goes into, do you have problems using different modes of transport? So often, I felt often the definitions in surveys were not that great, but it was what we had to work with. I mean, one thing that is prevalent often is an overemphasis, I think, on um, physical impairment to the exclusion of others. So, and, and to some extent, it was hard to avoid reproducing that because of the way that the debates, um, because of the definitions that we used and so on. So 
um, I would always want to go for a more inclusive definition, but sometimes in the data analysis, we were kind of limited with what we had, which wasn't as good as I would have liked. Thank you. Um, great, and I'm gonna, uh, I, I will uh, follow up with another question for, uh, for you, Rachel, uh, very quickly, which is um, how uh, representation, um, so there was a lot of uh, stuff in your presentation about uh, how represented uh, people with disabilities are um, as a share of, of the cycling population um, and of mode share. Um, and specifically, can you talk about how that compares uh, to other groups, uh, so such as uh, uh, women especially are, are one that are sort of commonly uh, underrepresented uh, in bicycling populations? Yes, one, one thing that I kind of found quite intriguing was that often the, the extent of underrepresentation was similar for these different groups. So if you look at women or older people, disabled people, um, black and minority ethnic people, we're all underrepresented groups in cycling in, in the UK. And the, the level of underrepresentation is really pretty similar. And what, what also intrigued me was the fact that often the explanations were very individualized, that, in, that, that, that if there was an assumption that disabled people were not capable of cycling, there were also assumptions that, you know, culturally women or older people didn't want to cycle or were not capable of cycling. And so it, it seemed like we'd created environments where people from all these different groups were being disproportionately excluded. And then in terms of transport planning, we'd then gone on to blame them for that and sort of say well this is because they're not physically capable or they're not culturally they're not interested they don't like to get sweaty or whatever the explanation was and it was really it was interesting for me to just see how similar those levels of underrepresentation are and to think you know we really our transport systems are disadvantaging similarly disadvantaging a whole range of groups in terms of cycling thank you um I do want to, to shift over to Atlanta now and ask Becky a question um, that's actually come in from a, a few folks. And I think this is a pretty common condition, which is that a lot of the bike infrastructure that cities are starting with is trail infrastructure. Um, and that's certainly true uh, in Atlanta, that much of your uh, infrastructure development started with um, a lot of energy behind the trail system. And so I wanted to just ask you to, to maybe talk a little bit how you're making the case uh, to move in to a, a more on-street focused network development um, and, and kind of what those, those discussions and what that process has been in that line. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, we have an amazing organization called PASS Foundation, which since really the Olympics in 1996 here uh, led the way on building a baseline trail network. Um, and then of course the Atlanta Beltline um, came along and has been built of six miles of the 22 mile loop. And that has made a tremendous impact. Um, but I think the case to be made and what we did in both Cycleana 1.0 and 2.0 was to really link the on-street facilities to the trail network to say, well, you know, right now you're viewing this, uh, a lot of people are viewing it as a recreational network, but what if you could get there comfortably by bike from your home, you know, would it encourage you to take other trips to it? Um, 10th Street, once again, which I mentioned in the first slide of my presentation, is by and far our most ridden on-street facility. Um, and that is directly at uh, linked to the Atlanta Beltline. And you see people coming on and off the trail, linking up to the 10th Street two-way bike lane. I would also have to say that, you know, our biggest leap right now is that we have a lot of, all of our protected infrastructure is two-way um, facilities, so no directional. So that's a really big push this year um, because I do believe part of everything is just seeing is believing. And so people are really starting in Atlanta since 2013, getting very comfortable with these two-way bike, bike facilities. So again, I think planning in a network is really important. Um, and, you know, uh, using some design terminology that is similar to trails, I think really convinces people. I think our Tech Parkway project, which is trail-like, although it does become a two-way cycle track, you know, that design palette was like, oh, I see, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, that really feels safe and protected and um, is similar to our trail network and links up to other um, pieces of infrastructure. 
Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, we, we've gotten a, a number of questions about um, sort of different uh, design uh, challenges, um, such as uh, parking and, and driveways and certain things. Um, and really, I kind of want to gear that in, in back into a discussion. Uh, uh, I think this is probably more for Becky, um, which is um, about uh, how having the contextual guidance um, and how having sort of the, the design manual, um, how does that influence the design process and specifically um, having that guidance uh, does it or has it changed sort of the way that you talk about uh, challenges like driveways and, and parking? Like, has it shifted the, the discussion to have the fallback or um, has it changed the way that your engineers think about streets? Um. I think having contextual guidance, um, like what is provided in the NACDO guidance, it, it sets the bar. So I think that's what we've found in Cycle Atlanta and with the NACTO contextual guidance is that it sets the bar of the discussion, right? So when we look, we do so much design work, capital project by capital project. And so when a capital project comes up and the first thing we do is the data collection of speed and crashes and um, you know motor vehicle traffic, it sets this conversation of like, okay, well, if we look at this matrix, what is appropriate? Um, because for so many years, and specifically starting in 1995, that has not been how we've had the discussion. We've had the discussion, okay, it's an arterial, so if we can fit in bike lanes, that's cool. Um, if we can't, then we can't. Um, and this is what this contextual guidance gives us is like, okay, this road needs to have a protected facility. So what can we compromise? What can we remove, uh, whether it's a travel lane or parking to fit that facility in? And we have lots of challenges. We have really narrow roadways. A lot of our arterials are four lanes, 10 foot lanes, you know, so 40 feet curb to curb. And so a lot of times it's very challenging um, trade offs but we need to start the conversation where it's like, how can we do the most uh, to keep people walking, taking transit and biking protected and safe and comfortable? And then we can start to work our way down versus let's move the cars. And then if we can fit anything else in, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of flipped, flipped the conversation. Absolutely. Um. All right. Uh, and so actually, uh, we've gotten uh, one or two questions about um, about e-bikes and, and pedal electric bikes. And so I want to uh, um, maybe start by asking this question to, to Rachel. I think this is a pretty hot topic on, on the, the planning scene in a lot of parts of the world. Um, and I wanted to ask if, if you've done any analysis um, on the impact that, that having those types of uh, technologies or, or tools available um, uh, if they have an influence on uh, the percent of people with disabilities or older people uh, uh, being able to use those, or, or if that influences cycling rates and decision to bike in, in places in the UK? Um, yes, I think e-bikes are really, really an exciting development. Obviously, we need good infrastructure. If we don't have good infrastructure, we're not going to get that transformational impact. But in a country like England, which is hilly, um, I've, we've, I've been involved in a team with a team doing some analysis of cycling potential and the impact that e-bikes could make and certainly for areas like Cornwall um, some of the areas some um, other parts of the country that are hilly it's going to make a really big difference for everyone it's going to make um, trips possible that people wouldn't want to cycle without the e-assist longer and heavier trips and it also does open it up to more people as well so you, you can see that potentially um, people who would struggle to cycle a particular distance with with the e-assist will be able to do that so I think um, for particular groups but also for people more broadly the potential is massive and you can see that use in um, places like the Netherlands Switzerland and so on where e-bikes are really being used a lot for longer trips and for hillier trips so I think the potential is there they can be um, they can be transformative but it is going to depend on getting that supportive environment and we don't really see we're not seeing big take up of e-bikes in the UK at the moment outside of maybe be a few places like Cambridge because I think that environment isn't there and we need that um, to enable e-bike use. Great. 
great. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pose a similar question to Becky. Um, have you had any uh, conversations about uh, e-bikes in Atlanta that uh, you think are, are sort of relevant to the broader community? I know it's sort of a regulatory question in, in a lot of NACO cities, um, but I'm, I'm curious if that's entered in, into your planning discussions. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if I'm having an atypical city experience, but everyone in Atlanta is super jazzed about electric bikes and their potential. Uh, we have a very hilly city, um, not quite as hilly as San Francisco, but definitely uh, surprisingly hilly if you've never been to Atlanta. Um, and, you know, I think the common folklore of why biking will not work in Atlanta is that it's hot and it's hilly. Um, and so generally across the board, um, in all the different departments, everyone has been really, really excited about the potential for electric bikes. I think it, it has highlighted some need for better pedestrian and bicycle separation. Um, Atlanta Beltline, for example, is uh, 14 feet and uh, mixed bike ped traffic and definitely um, causes tension. Um, especially because of the, it's a really, 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 really high use. And so I, I think that hopefully where this will go for us is really the discussion of ensuring that pedestrians um, have their space um, and feel protected uh, when mixing with, with biking, because even just on a regular bike, that's already a challenge. So, um, but generally, we've been having just really positive discussions about incorporation of electric bikes into our bike share system, um, you know, and just general use of electric bikes across the city. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we're, we're approaching the end of our time. Um, uh, a couple things that I, I do want to call out first. Um, we got a couple questions about grade um, and maybe... Uh, Becky and Rachel, feel free to jump in. Uh, the NACO guidance does not include grade as a consideration, um, just because it's, it's, it's a consideration that is sort of locally sensitive and, and varies a lot by city. And um, But that said, there are existing uh, resources within the NACO community, uh, specifically the city of Vancouver has a city-specific policy on all ages and abilities, bike infrastructure that uh, has some discussion of grade. Um, and so I wanted to refer out to that. Um, and I'll, uh, um, I'll give uh, our presenters the, the opportunity to comment if, if you have any additional uh, things to add about uh, grade uh, in terms of uh, how it, for, it changes. Uh, yeah. For, for us in Atlanta, I think we first consider that on a network level, um, you know, where are the most desirable routes for biking? Um, and so, you know, we have greatly prioritized flatter routes, because um, that should only more, be more comfortable. Um, but we do have streets that are, you know, are steep. And I, I think what we have mostly been looking at is the width of the protected bike lanes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, from, from a grade perspective, if you want to see a really challenging project from a grade perspective, uh, feel free to zoom into John Portman in our downtown. It's a two-way protected bike lane, granite curb, um, and it's it's tight. It's only, I think, eight and a half, nine feet wide, and it's two-way. It's on a really challenging um, slope. Um, so if you want to see a project, uh, I think in the future we would – it doesn't have an incredibly high volume, probably about 200 people biking daily. Um, but I think that in the future, facilities like that, we would look at making wider – um, as we have uh, more ridership on them. Great. Um, all right, so with that, we are at two o'clock. I really want to uh, thank everyone uh, who joined. This was uh, a lot of fun for, for us, and I, I hope it was informative. Um, and I really want to thank uh, my co-presenters, uh, Dr. Rachel Aldred and Becky Katz. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your, your research and your experience uh, with this audience. and. Uh, with that, stay tuned for uh, a couple upcoming events. Um, we'll be uh, announcing a series of webinars on uh, transit interagency collaboration. Um, and then we have a couple locally focused events that are forthcoming. Um, but with that, um, 
Thank you for joining us. Uh, this was uh, very exciting and, and we look forward to the next one and we'll talk to you all soon.